It's now time for the sixth part of Worth. Stiff in her chair, Ma ate little, said nothing, and didn't look up when she passed food. My brain dribble of an idea almost felt worse than having to hear Ma and Pa yell at each other. I prayed Pa would think better of it, take the milk stool back to the barn after supper, and never bring it back. But he didn't. He got up from the table, wiped his face, then left saying, I better check the rest of the fences before dark. John scrambled off his stool, knocking the crate down. I'll bring the animals in. John rushed out before Paul could respond, but I saw him shake his head like he had when I picked up a seed bag from the wrong end and dumped it on the barn floor. That gave me a smile, but Ma slammed things around like she'd rather break the dishes than clean them. I helped her, but she didn't so much as look at me. Part of me wanted to know why she hated John Worth so much. I knew why I hated him, but did Ma see him the same way? Was it just because he reminded her of the kids who robbed Mrs. Faringale? or that Pa didn't get her approval first? In her mood, I didn't have the courage to ask, and she didn't need to tell me to go study. As soon as the table was clear and the dishes were clean, I headed straight to my room and closed the door. I wanted to be free of all the anger in the air. I even opened my bedroom window to let it all float out over the fields. After Mr. Kennel made a new rule that fighting at recess meant plugging chinks in the soddy or fixing the roof after school let out, the boys split up at recess. The gantry crew shooting marbles in one corner of the schoolyard and the Danver crew shooting in another. But both lots seemed to do nothing more, seemed to be doing more talking than shooting, almost like they were planning something. All I wanted to do was keep out of their way, and after a time, I knew just how to do that. Each day, Mr. Kennel read a poem before he rang the bell. When he called recess, he followed us out the door with his desk chair, set it by the door, then ate his lunch. When his meal was over, he'd pull a book from his vest, a collection of Keats poems, I'd seen it when he leaned over to correct my sums, or, should I say, to show me just how many I'd done wrong. Well, each day he'd read one of those poems, then reach down for the bell he kept at his feet, calling in a stampeding herd of kids with me, hobbling along behind like an old heifer who'd gotten snared up in some barbed wire on her way. The kids all snickered when I dragged myself into school after everyone had come in, and found their places. To give myself a little peace, I waited for Mr. Kennel to pick up his book, then I headed for the school door. Knowing I could get inside before he called in the herd, even gave me time to reach my seat. One day I found a kind of flower on my bench in that dank room. Someone had left an orange on a hanky in my spot, peeled and opened like a flower. Oranges are Christmas fruit, not day-to-day -day giving fruit. Whoever left me that juicy present meant something real special by it, but I didn't know what. So why do you suppose someone would leave an orange all opened up like a flower on Nate's seat? Share what you're thinking with your fellow listeners. couldn't find no note nor any sign the giver wanted me to know who it was. I folded up the hanky and set it in my pail before anyone could see what I had. Didn't want anyone begging for my orange or teasing me to get it for getting it. All afternoon I sat wondering who could have given me that orange, my mind settling on folks in turn. Theo Harper dropped worms on my head from the hill over the river when I went fishing. The Campbell boy didn't like me on account of the fact I didn't treat John regular, orphan, defending orphan, I guess. The Kerensky twins used to shove me back and forth on the boardwalk in front of the mercantile if they caught me there alone. Margaret Plank said I smelled like cow 
dumb. Pretty much all the kids hated me, and those who weren't spending their time hating me chose up sides between the Danvers and the Gantries, and the Danvers and Gantries hated each other. And when they weren't fighting in the schoolyard, they were gathered in clusters, hatching their next attack. The little kids didn't pay me much mind, but to laugh at me for being dumber than a sheep, so I couldn't figure out who'd give me a kind word, let alone something as truly special as an orange. Looking over the room again, I realized I'd skipped right over those new kids from Greece. Maybe one of them gave me the orange for not calling them any names. Mr. Peel, Mr. Kennel smacked his ruler down on my table. Perhaps you'd do better in your studies if you paid more attention to them. Yes, sir, I said, putting my eyes on my table, but his slap had sent my leg to jumping, the whole room filled with laughter. Sneaking a peek at the Cordemus kids, I saw that they didn't laugh. Back to work, Mr. Kenno shouted, and the room fell quiet. When school let out, I waited for the other kids to run home so I could walk to the mercantile to meet up with Ma. Setting out, I kept my eyes on my feet. You need repair? Anemone made me look up. She stood on the edge of the path over the creek, pointing at my shoes. My father, he is... She bit her lip to remember the word in English. A cobbler? He fixes shoes. I pointed at my shoes like an idiot. Yes, she nodded. The smile told me she given me the orange. I dug in my pail to pull it out. Offering it, I said, want to share? Her smile grew. Yes. We walked to the mercantile together, eating the orange. When our ship went to New York, Mana bought the oranges. We have too many. People didn't buy too much fruit. I figured she said that, so I didn't think she was sweet on me or something. It's good. I hadn't tasted an orange since the Christmas we moved to the farm in Goshen. I was six. Hmm, she hummed, sucking a slice. They have a lot of fruit and grease. She laughed, holding her hands up. All the fruit you can eat. What else? Water, she spun. Everywhere, and trees, such beautiful trees, all green but the mountains with their faces of stone. That sounds so nice. I'd never seen a mountain except in pictures. Why would anyone want to leave such a place? It's the best place on earth, she smiled then laughed. But Nebraska is very nice. I smiled mostly because Nebraska was no match for an island at sea, but also because she said Nebraska with a knee at the beginning and it sounded funny, Nebraska. It's better than living in a desert, I guess. Nate! Ma startled me, appearing in front of us like a ghost. I hadn't been paying any mind to where we were going, but looking up, I saw that we'd made it to the mercantile. Who's this? Oh, Anemone Cordemus. Meet my Ma, Mary Eve Peel. Mrs. Peel, she nodded her head. Anemone nodded her head. Anemone, the nymph who refused to yield to the wind. Yes, Anemone smiled to have someone say something about her name that had nothing to do with the flower. Good to meet you, Anemone, but we best get home for supper. Yes, good to meet you, Mrs. Peel. Anemone's accent made all the words sound like new. She made the end of our name sound like a musical note. I liked that. Thanks for the orange, I whispered, in case anybody from school might be listening in. Paracolo. Come again? Uh-huh. You're welcome. In Greek. Oh, I nodded. Thanks. We waved and went our separate ways. As we rode home, I asked Ma what she meant by what she said about Anemone's name. She told me that there was this Greek story about a little spirit called a nymph that tried to outrun the wind and was turned into a flower. Said the Greeks had hundreds of that kind of story to explain how things came about. 
I decided I'd have to ask Anemone about those stories in school. But for the night, I just wanted to enjoy the feeling that somebody liked me. That warm in the heart feeling I had known since we left the farm, and I had to say goodbye to Benny Sadler, who lived down the road. I lay in bed, thinking for a good long while. Then John Worth had to go and ruin it all by having a rip-roaring nightmare. I knocked on the wall to stop all the racket. He bolted up, making the bed bump into the wall, saying, Who's there? The fear in his voice caught me tight between hating him for ruining such a good feeling and wanting to say something nice so that he wasn't so scared. It kept me silent heard him breathing heavy for a bit, then he started mumbling to himself as he settled back into bed. I just felt empty all over again, wishing I'd be able to talk to Anemone again the next day. I fell asleep with the sweetness of oranges in my mouth. Fence cutters struck under the cover of night, snipping through barbed wire and spurring the cattle to stampede into the fields. The bellowing shook me from my sleep. Rising, I could see the dusty cloud of horns and backs trampling through our corn. Pa ran out the front door, screaming to scare them back. Ma's cattle calls echoed his as they ran for the barn. Pounding on the wall, I roused to John. Hurry, bring a coat. What's happening? John asked, his face ashen as he met me in the kitchen. Grabbing his coat, I yelled, Someone's let the cattle through. We've got to herd them back. As Pa and Ma tore out of the barn bareback, Pa called, John, get Seth Clemson over here. I don't know where he lives, John shouted back, but Pa headed into the field, hollering and waving a coiled rope to scare the cattle east. Mr. Clemson lived on the bluff over the river nearly a mile away. I never would have made it there before dawn. I grabbed John by the shoulders, surprised to find I stood taller than he did, shouted the directions, then shoved him on his way. He ran, his white nightshirt disappearing into the darkness. So what do you think is going to happen next? Share with your fellow listeners. Now, just a little more of Worth as Pa and Ma drove the cattle onto the slope toward the river. I stood in the dooryard, waving madly with my coat and John's to shoe stragglers toward the road. We'd never get them back through the narrow opening in the fence line, but we could get them off our property. Before Ma and Pa could clear the cattle out, Seth Clemson thundered in with a small posse of cattle, cattle hands to round up the rest, dropping John at my side before charging into the field. John stumbled and shook as if he'd been dead center in that cornfield when the herd charged through the fence. Knowing they had more capable hands at the ready, I dragged John into the house. The boy couldn't even walk straight, so I dumped him into a chair. His legs trembled more than mine usually did. A quick tinge of revenge sunk under the weight of my pity. What had scared this kid enough to make his bones quake? A kid who'd seen a boy hang? What happened? Happened? He stared at me like I'd ask why he feared the devil. The river filled with cattle as I headed for the bridge. Thought they'd run me down. Cursing myself for not sending him further south to cross, I set to warming him a little water to calm him down. Ma always fixed me up a little water with a stick of cinnamon when fear had me jumping like a bug. John didn't speak. He just panted down his fear while the makeshift tea brewed, then took the cup with a nod as I said, It'll quiet, it. It'll quiet you. Gripping the cup, John said, Never been in the country in the dark like that. Thought the ground might swallow me up. John's words pulled me to the street outside our apartment on the night Ma sent me after medicine for Missy. She'd been wailing sick for days. Ma walked the floor with her for hours, so Pa worked double shifts to keep their wages regular. 
no one but me, no one but me could go for the medicine, but the idea of traveling the streets at night had me gasping for breath by the time I'd reached the stoop. Thieves and killers lurked in the shadows of the street. I'd seen the crowd circling the dead in the mornings, heard the wailing in the halls when a second shifter lost a pocketbook to quick hands in the dark. I couldn't move fast enough between the pools of light under the street lamps. Even the distant clomp of a horse's hoof sent me running like a, like a hounded rabbit. Knowing John's fear made me feel closed in somehow, but I couldn't just let him sit there and shiver. And we can't just sit here any longer. We have other things to do, but worth will continue.